So hi everyone, I'm Haley. Uh, welcome to our first webinar, Managing Cucurbit Bacterial Wilt with Row Covers and Perimeter Trap Cropping. I'll invite Mark and Erica uh, to both go ahead and start their cameras and sound, and we can begin the first part of the presentation. Okay. okay. There we yep. Hi, I'm Mark Leeson, and uh, right there next to me is Erica Sala Rojas. And uh, we're going to get started with this uh, presentation now. Everybody see that okay? Okay, well, tonight we want to talk about managing cucurbit bacterial wilt with row covers and perimeter trap cropping. This is part of a um, set of results from a team at Iowa State University, Penn State University, and University of Kentucky. And many of the scientists that have been involved with these projects are, are online in the webinar tonight, so uh, questions can be answered by, by any of those folks. So over the next 50 minutes or so, we'll talk first, as Haley said, about this one strategy for bacterial wilt control, delayed removal of row covers, and take questions and answer, followed by a presentation on perimeter trap cropping and then again, questions and answers. But that's kind of our format. Just to put some names here to voices or, or maybe little thumbnail pictures that you'll see of people at Iowa State, uh, as you've already uh, seen us, uh, Mark and Erica. Uh, we also have Donald Lewis and Laura Jesse online from entomology. So we're covering plant pathology and entomology there. From Penn State, we have Shelby Fleischer, who's an entomologist there and Elsa Sanchez from Horticulture. University of Kentucky, Mark Williams uh, from Horticulture there is, is on, as well as Rick Besson from Entomology. And from Ohio State, we have Celeste Welty in Entomology, Mary Gardner in Entomology, Sally Miller uh, from Plant Pathology. So that's kind of our cast. Okay, let's just think about the crops that are affected by bacterial wilt. They're in this group, the cucurbits. One of these that I'm showing here is really not a host of bacterial wilt, and that's watermelon. But everything else I'm showing here, the butternut or the winter squash, the cucumber, the musk melon, pumpkin, even summer squash, they're all hosts of bacterial wilt. So it's a, it's a disease that we worry about in a wide range of cucurbit crops. Tonight our purpose is to give you an update on the research that we've been doing uh, and, and hopefully with some, um, some applications that, are, that are, are available now or will be in the near future. So now Erica is going to take over and talk uh, a little bit about an introduction to bacterial wilt and the, the row cover strategy. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Haley, and thank you, for, uh, Mark, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here and participating in this webinar. And before we go into the details of row covers and how we have used them against bacterial wilt, let's review um, the, some characteristics of the disease. So bacterial wilt is caused by a bacterium called Erwinia trachephala, and this is a vascular pathogen, meaning that it invades the vascular system, or specifically the xylem vessels of cucurbit crops that Mark mentioned previously. It is transmitted by cucumber beetles, both the spotted and the striped cucumber beetles, and all of those that are familiar with cucurbits, I can assure you that you've seen these in your fields pretty much every season. The main vector of bacterial wilt, and the one that we know the most about, is the striped cucumber beetle, which is on the right-hand side of the picture. Beetles can carry or harbor the bacteria in their digestive system, and when they feed on cucurbit plants, that's when they transmit the pathogen into the plants, and eventually the plants wilt and die. Transmission occurs mainly through the leaves, and this is one of my all-time favorite pictures because it illustrates all the factors present in order for disease to occur, infection to occur. We have a beetle uh, that has been overwintering the, or that harbors the bacteria in their digestive system. 
And these black dots that I'm highlighting with my mouse are beetle poop, or the polite way of calling them fraz, and they are infested or covered, packed with bacteria, with the pathogen early nature cephala. And when the fraz comes into contact with fresh feeding wounds that I'm highlighting here, that's how the pathogen enters the vascular system. And once in the vascular system, that's when it causes the wilting symptom. Interestingly, and this is something that we did not know about until 2010, some Penn State researchers found that another way that the pathogen can enter the vascular system of the plants is through frass or beetle poop deposited on, directly onto the cucurbit flowers or the blossoms. Once inside the vascular system, the bacteria multiply and symptoms can uh, appear anywhere in between a couple of days or one or two weeks. And that's just a close up of what the bacteria look like inside the xylem system or the vascular tissue. On these two pictures, this is, these are two different stages of the disease on musk melon. So on the left, you have the beginning or the onset of the symptoms. And on the right, you have a, a, a plant that, that's uh, on its way out due to bacterial wilt infection. Plants infected with bacterial wilt rarely recover, and it may start as uh, wilting or sort of plants that look drought stressed, they don't recover and they eventually collapse. Although the symptoms may vary with the crop, um, some the result is the same, the plants die. Uh, on the bottom picture that I just, uh, that just appeared here is a picture of a zucchini plant also infected by bacterial wilt. Now it's important to mention that in cucurbit crops there's uh, all sorts of root diseases and also other insects, insect pests that can uh, show similar symptoms to bacterial wilt. So to confirm the disease, make sure that you inspect the plant properly and that you uh, check uh, specifically the base of the plant to make sure that there's not another pathogen or insect issue that could be causing similar uh, confusing symptoms. The bacterial wilt is a disease that we have seen in um, more of the Midwest and Northeastern part of the country. This circle here depicts where the regions or the states where bacterial wilt is an issue. And although the disease has been detected or reported elsewhere, this is the highest risk zone or where growers struggle the most uh, with this disease. This is a representation of the risk period for bacterial wilt. And on the bottom, we're depicting the season, or uh, early season and later onto the season. And on the y-axis or the vertical axis, we have the risk of bacterial wilt infection. And in general, the highest risk period for bacterial wilt infection is early in the season. And why is that? Well, there are several reasons. Number one, we have overwintering beetles that are already carrying the pathogen or the bacterium inside their digestive system. And these beetles become active as soon as temperatures or air temperatures uh, reach about 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. At the same time, when these beetles are active, uh, this is when when we're putting our transplants or when cucurbit plants are emerging. And these beetles are very, very good at locating cucurbit fields and colonizing them very quickly. So once you have the cucumber beetles in your field, they're already feeding and potentially transmitting the pathogen. Later in the season, although you can still have bacterial wilt outbreaks, there is a decreased risk of infection. 
And this is most likely due to an increased resistance of the plants. So as plants grow and they're mature, they're less susceptible to the disease. So what do growers do now to control bacterial wilt? Now there are several options, and one is to delay planting date. And the picture that I showed before is showing the highest risk period. So one way of preventing bacterial wilt transmission is by skipping that flush of overwintering beetles, meaning that you would avoid the highest risk period during the springtime and have a lower risk of bacterial wilt transmission. One of the setback strategy is that it can also delay harvest. So prices or premium prices in the market, midsummer or early in the summer may be lower if you choose to delay harvest or delay the planting date. Conventional, uh, in a conventional cropping system, meaning uh, conventional or synthetic uh, pesticides and fertilizer, the most common tool is to control the beetles using insecticides, mainly neonicotinoids and also pyrethroids. Some of the problems associated with the use of insecticides is that beetle pressure can trigger multiple sprays and it is, there's a risk of damaging pollinators, both honeybees and wild pollinators. Also the health hazards associated with pesticides, specifically the risk associated to the applicators, and the fact that these um, insecticides can be costly. Organic growers have fewer options, and this is mainly because insecticides, organic insecticides against cucumber beetles can be very pricey, and they're often ineffective. In some cases, and this is a comment that we've heard from some growers, is that they just, that growing highly susceptible crops, cucurbit crops, is just not a feasible option. And they might decide to just go with other crops instead of cucurbits. How can row covers help to control bacterial wilt? Well, row covers are not new in vegetable and fruit crops. And when we talk about row covers during our field trials, we're talking about non-woven, breathable fabric that's made out of uh, polypropylene. Some of the benefits of row covers uh, are not only that they enhance earliness, they warm up the soil and the air temperature uh, so that plants develop almost like in a microclimate or a greenhouse like uh, climate under the cover. They also provide protection against harsh weather conditions like rain, frost, and in the case of bacterial wilt, we've been exploring the added benefit that it pro provides a physical barrier against cucumber beetles that could potentially feed on plants and transmit the bacterial wilt pathogen. Row covers, in order for them to be effective, uh, we have found that they have to be placed over the rows immediately after transplanting. So you really don't want to leave any chance for those beetles flying around to get in contact with the plant. Uh, more commonly, how we use the row covers is we place them over wire hoops so that the plants are not damaged by um, high temperatures or by the row cover itself. Early trials of, uh, of in Iowa versus bacterial wilt gave us some very interesting and promising results that when we use row covers and remove them at the start of flowering, or female flowering to be more specific, they showed moderate bacterial wilt suppression. However, bacterial wilt was not managed or was not controlled 
throughout the entire season. By removing the row covers 10 days later after the start of flowering, we found that this was a much more effective strategy to suppress bacterial wilt all season long. This led to a collaboration, a multi-state project with Iowa, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. And in the previous trials that I just mentioned, we were managing bacterial wilt in a muskmelon system in, con in a conventional cropping system. So from two 2009 to 2012, this collaboration funded by the Organic Research Education Initiative, um, we explored the uses and the different timing of row cover strategies in an organic uh, cropping system to protect against bacterial wilt. We focused mainly on, most, on muskmelon and also winter squash, in this case, butternut squash. And the first thing that we found out is that we had regional differences in bacterial wilt risk. Both in Iowa and Pennsylvania, we found that varying beetle populations or varying uh, beetle densities led to sporadic disease outbreaks or just light outbreaks of bacterial wilt. That is not the case in Kentucky where longer, higher temperatures and a longer season uh, maintains the beetle pressure constant and uh, high beetle numbers throughout the entire season. And now some of our results uh, from the OREI trials. I want to focus on muskmelon first. And mainly what we found from our field trials is that both in Iowa and Pennsylvania, by removing the row covers 10 days after the beginning of flowering, we got very effective or very good control of bacterial wilt. On average, we had 30% less bacterial wilt in these field trials just by this 10 day, 10 delay removal in comparison to an uncovered control. In Kentucky, and this is associated to the high beetle populations or the beetle pressure, we found that removal at the start of flowering was the best option for bacterial wilt control. And removal at the start of flowering is what growers that are already using row covers are most likely to, um, to do, or that's when they decide to remove the row covers um, traditionally. In butternut, we also have had different timing of removal, but we found in all three states that removing the covers at the start of flowering gave most consistent results in terms of bacterial wilt control and also yield. So there was not really a benefit um, specifically against bacterial wilt in delaying the removal of the covers. Now, one of the benefits of having those covers and an added benefit is issues with squash bug which seemed to be more of a issue in some of our locations and some of our field trials than bacterial wilt. Now, you must be wondering what happens after I remove the row covers, specifically in locations where there is high beetle numbers or high beetle densities throughout the season. Well, we trigger our insecticide applications based on scouting. And scouting can be uh, done directly, walking through your field and, and observing beetles on plants, or also with sticky cards or monitoring st uh, cards in beetles. And in general, we have a threshold in which if one beetle per plant is observed in the field, that means that you should take some sort of control measure, whether this is a conventional organic insecticide spray to control the bacterial wilt. 
Conventional products, uh, more commonly what we used after the row covers were removed, uh, synthetic pyrethroids, and in the case of organic production, we used surround, which is kale and clay, and also an organic insecticide, coal and trust, with an attractant that's called sidetrack D. And this is based on the scouting, what um, some of the products or some of the management strategies, strategies that we employed after the row covers came off. Some of the take home points from the ORAI project is the row covers can help to control bacterial wilt um, and they can control bacterial wilt effectively without the need of multiple insecticide applications. However, the timing of removal might depend on the geographic region and also on the crop. So to summarize, in muskmelon, the best treatment against bacterial wilt was removing the row covers 10 days after the start of flowering. And this was also the case in Pennsylvania. So this is the best strategy for both Iowa and Pennsylvania. However, in Kentucky, the best removal strategy was at the start of female flowering. In the case of butternut squash, the row cover removal at the start of flowering gave the best results and this was consistent in all of the states, in all three states. Finally, uh, based on the information that we've gathered and our experiences out in the field, it leaves several interesting questions and new directions that we want to explore, like how can we cut down the row cover labor and expense? One option, and this is something that we're gonna look into, is how can we mechanize the handling or the use of row covers? And another question is, can we replace the non-woven row cover by a much more durable material such as woven mesh? And we're gonna look into this in 2014 and the coming years just to lower the expenses on the row cover and make it more um, feasible for growers. And also another question is how to secure the row covers. And traditionally what we have done in Iowa is we bury the sides of the row covers under the soil. But we want to evaluate other alternatives that are in the market. Like for example, can we use sandbags to pin down the row covers? Tubes of river rock um, is something that has been used in field trials in Kentucky. Water-filled lay flat and also pegs or ground, sta ground staples. So these are all things that we're working on to see if we can um, make row covers more feasible and more cost effective for growers. With that, that's a brief sum sum summary of row covers and our experiences and before we move on to Perimeter trap crops, another alternative to manage bacterial wilt. I would um, love to handle any questions or have the panel participate and handle any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark and Erica. Um, everyone will now begin our first question and answer session. Uh, our question and answer panel, if you could all please turn on your audio and your video, that would be wonderful. I will go ahead and start with our first question uh, from Blaine in Ohio. He asked about delayed and um, he says, how delayed and what are the specific things in Ohio? Sorry, what was the rest of it? Uh, missed your last part there, Haley. What are the specific dates in Ohio? And I think more specifically Northeast Ohio for Blaine. Well, I, I'll, I'll be willing to ch chime in on that. Okay. Um, got 10 minutes for our Q&A here, so I've got the timer going, so go ahead. It, 
so we start seeing spring activity about 150 to 200 degree days at counting from January 1st with a base of, um, I think it's 55 Fahrenheit. So that, I'd, depending on the temperatures of that year, that's when we start seeing activity. So in your farm or farmscape or surrounding landscape, uh, if you have cucurbit crops planted about that time, and I can tell you in central Pennsylvania, that's about the last week of May till through the first week of June, um, they'll end up picking up most of the immigrate, the overwintering adults that are active. So at, in central Pennsylvania, plantings that happen the last week of June, um, even sometimes the first few days of July, tends to have much, much lower pressure. I don't know if that directly answers your question in, in, in Ohio, but that's what we've experienced in central Pennsylvania. About, about the timing of cover removal, did you catch that? Oh, cover removal? I thought it was delayed planning. Um, he asked about uh, cover removal. Cover removal was Blaine's second question. Um, so she wanted to know about the timing of row cover removal in Northeast Ohio. You want to comment, Celeste? Uh, well, I thought the question was about delayed planning itself, and I would agree with Shelby that around the third week of June or at the end of June is fine. You're, it gets dangerous if you go much into July that you don't have enough time to get the crop um, fully developed. If it's for when to remove the, the row covers, I'd say we are more like Kentucky. Most It depends on the year, um, but in central Ohio, we are generally more like Kentucky. We have heavy beetle pressure. Um, and the delay doesn't help as much. Uh, in Northern Ohio, some, some years we just do not have much pressure. So it sort of depends on the year, whether we're high pressure or low pressure. Is that you, Ajay, speaking? No, it's not me. I think it's Mark. That's Mark Williams. Yes. Mark. Can you uh, can you have a try with your audio again? I think it's pretty hard to hear for everyone. You can get up to the mic. Yeah. I, I was just saying that uh, I was agreeing with uh, Celeste that some years uh, we have uh, very heavy diesel pressure and other years we do much to do. So it depends on the year. Okay. Um, is that sufficient for Blaine's question? Um, Maybe, maybe just add uh, one thing to that, and that is uh, one of the issues that came up in our experiments, our field experiment, was where to mark the start of flowering. Because there's two kinds of flowers, for instance, on muskmelon that we were working with. There's a female, there's a male flower, which usually appears earlier, and then a female or, or so-called perfect flower that appears later. And the, the beginning of flowering, according to this row cover timing, is supposed to start when the first female flowers appear, not, not the first male flowers, but the first female. They have that little bulge at the bottom below the blossom. That shows that they're female. Uh, and that's the start of uh, what they call anthesis or the, uh, where you can start uh, having fruit being fertilized. So then 10 days after that is when you'd be uh, thinking about removing according to that 10 day delay strategy that uh, was reasonably consistently effective in Iowa and Pennsylvania. Other questions? Okay, uh, our third question is from Jeff. Um, he asked if there's a reduction in crop production from delaying row crop removal, uh, row cover removal, 10 days. Well, um, maybe the horticulturists want to comment here too, but it's not so much a reduction in the, in the uh, yield as a, as a delay in the yield. And what we've seen fairly consistently, consistently is a delay of about one week. If you delay removing the row covers by 10 days, at the end of the season, that costs you about one week in terms of the, the crop um, uh, being harvested about on average a week later. Okay. Um, and then our next question is from Robert Beck. Uh, will this severe winter affect the beetles? Uh, I'd be glad to chime in and say, Spotted cucumber beetle? Absolutely, yes. They'll, they're going to get pushed back 
to more southern locations. Striped cucumber beetle, which is our more larger concern here, um, yeah, but not so much. Um, if there's not a lot of snow, that'll hurt them worse. But um, they've the striped cucumber beetle has a good diapause capacity. I'm, I'm sure it's going to knock them back, but um, at least here in Pennsylvania, I don't think it'll knock them out of the state or anything like that. Where in Pennsylvania, it would knock the spotted cucumber beetle out. So it'll it'll, it'll reduce your pressure, but um, you still need to be prepared for the striped cucumber beetle. Okay, our next question is from Mishaga. In organic production, should I employ both surround and entrust plus sidetrack D? I hope I said those correctly. I guess I could comment on that. This is Celeste. Um, we think you have to be a little careful. Those two strategies are sort of very opposite of each other. So you really should choose either one or the other because the idea with surround, it repels the beetles, that it makes the plants unattractive. The idea with the sidetrack is it makes the, the plant more attractive. It's trying to bring the insect into the poison, the entrust that you want them to eat. Um, so it is better to use one or the other the only thing to keep in mind, you are only allowed to use and trust twice. So I would suggest starting use and trust twice, and hopefully that'll do the job, the trust plus sidetrack. If that doesn't do the job, then switch to surround later in the season. Um, I, I, a, a few comments I'd like to push on that is, um, so if you if you can only use the entrust a few times, if you can if you can try and control that early season, first generation, um, and then do as much sanitation as you can. And by that, I mean, pick your crop clean and then if possible, uh, remove it from the environment, you know, when you're done, till it under, as opposed to having many successive plantings of, of many uh, cucurbit crops. That'll get you kind of a farm level sanitation approach that'll help uh, keep the beetle pressure down low later in the season. And the other is don't get, uh, don't assume that just because it's an organic insecticide that it's okay for bees. Uh, these, the uh, spinosad type materials, which mix up the active ingredient for Entrust, and there's non-organic certified options for that as well, uh, they can be highly toxic to bees. So do all the same things that uh, conventional growers, we, we urge conventional growers to do. Try and spray when the flowers are closed. Um, and that'll minimize the amount of act activity of bees on fresh residues. I think we can handle about one more question if you have one, Haley, and then other questions uh, we can reply to by email after the program. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Okay, and we've got one left from Mike Patrick. Um, he's asking, do the beetles overwinter in your garden if you have them? Um, the answer is uh, probably yes. The uh, the old literature says they overwinter in sheltered locations, edges of fields, and I'm sure that's true. We've gone inside of fields and put um, cages on top of soil at, at, you know, in February, March, and um, proven to ourselves that they were in the soil, they emerged from that location. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the, the beetles are tracking the cucurbits over time. So they're moving around the farmscape looking for wherever their cucurbit crops. In our case, we found them overwintering in old pumpkin fields or winter squash fields. Pumpkin fields where people harvested them for face pumpkins and left ones that weren't you know, sold. They just left them in the ground, left them kind of rotting there. And, and we found the beetles overwintering in there. So if you do some, farm, some uh, sanitation there, try and clean those cucurbits out of the field, that'll reduce the problem in a garden setting. Um, you know, once the zucchinis and squashes aren't doing so well with all the powdery mildew and stuff, clean it up. And, and that might reduce any overwintering in that location. Okay, I guess we can move on then, Haley, right? Great, yep, we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, good. Okay, so the second subject here tonight is perimeter trap cropping. Again, we've had some field trial experience with this that we wanted to share with you. Uh, again, the target is um, trying to suppress bacterial will, same disease we've been talking about. This is giving you a visual of how 
perimeter trap cropping, which we're abbreviating PTC, how this uh, is supposed to work. So here we have a cucurbit field and we have a nearby sort of edge of the field. And we have really two crops grown in the same field under this perimeter trap crop strategy. We have a border crop, which is typically two rows at the edge of a field. And then we have a main crop, which is the entire rest of the field. So these are two different cucurbit crops. And the border crop is designed to be a cucurbit crop that is highly attractive, very, very attractive to cucumber beetles. They want to locate there and they want to stay there whereas the main crop is somewhat less attractive to cucumber beetles. So in the springtime, as, as Shelby uh, described and Erica described, the beetles are coming into the field from the outside. They don't fly very high. They're typically at knee level or, or, there, or thereabouts. So the first thing they encounter when they come into the border is that, that highly attractive crop, and they tend to stay there and aggregate or essentially accumulate in big numbers right there in the border crop. So once those numbers get up past a threshold in the border crop, and you determine that by scouting, the idea is to spray an insecticide on the border crop to kill those cucumber beetles. So the general idea is that the cucumber beetles will not pass in any great numbers past the border crop into the main crop. So you've used that border crop as a, as a barrier, a live barrier to block or, or slow the entry of those cucumber beetles into the main crop. That's the concept and that's what we were testing. The inspiration for this perimeter trap crop work came from about 10 years of work in Massachusetts with butternut squash as the main crop. This work was done by Ruth Hazard and her team at University of Massachusetts and also in Rhode Island by Jude Boucher. The trap crop that they used in these experiments was, was uh, Hubbard squash. So this was the, the double border row around the main crop of butternut squash. And in their experiments and in, in field trials with growers on in field scale experiments, these weren't just small experimental farm experiments, but rather field scale experiments, they saved about 90% on the insecticide use compared to what growers had been putting on to protect butternut squash against cucumber beetle and bacterial wilt uh, before using the strategy. So it's been, uh, a success story in, in New England uh, with, with using butternut squash as the main crop. So with that inspiration, we began a project in 2011 and 2012 in Iowa and Ohio to see if that strategy would adapt to our somewhat different cucumber beetle populations and, and soils and climate um, uh, here in the, the Midwest. And we also tried a different uh, main crop, which was muskmelon. A key, and this is what was learned in, the, in, the, um, in New England, a key is to get the trap crop, those two border rows, implanted in the field first, usually two weeks, at least two weeks ahead of when you plant the main crop. So these young ladies are just about um, ready to plant that, that border crop before the main crop goes in. This is a view of one of our small experimental scale plots in Iowa uh, in early summer. And the main crop here is muskmelon. And what you see as a border crop here is buttercup squash, not butternut, but butter or, or, or um, Hubbard squash, but rather buttercup squash. It's again, highly attractive to cucumber beetles. As you can see, it's a very robust crop. Uh, it grows like a weed. It makes a, a, a decent physical barrier as well as that chemically attractive barrier to the cucumber beetles. The results of these trials of course, cucumber beetle pressure varies from year to year, as we all know, and site to site. But we were impressed that the cucumber beetles stayed consistently pretty well in the trap crop, and only a very limited number got beyond that into the main crop. And we, we noticed there was a significant reduction in insecticide use when we used that perimeter trap crop strategy compared to a control plot nearby that did not use the strategy and the yield was not really affected, but the key thing was the insecticide use by this alternative strategy was reduced. So in these early adaptation experiments in the Midwest, we felt we saw encouraging evidence that perimeter trap cropping could work. There are some challenges as there are with any new strategy. One challenge is trying to manage 
two crops in the same field because we have not just one cucurbit crop, but two. We have the border crop, which is one cucurbit crop, and the main crop, which is another one. One challenge, obviously, is marketing. Can you market both, in our case, musk melon and buttercup? And of course, uh, when you have a melon and a squash in the same field, you're going to have to manage different pests, particularly for the, uh, the border crop, uh, the buttercup squash, you have to really think hard about squash bug and some, in some places squash vine borer in addition to the cucumber beetle issue. So management is, is somewhat more complex because you have to think about two crops. The other issue is getting beyond our small fields, which is where they started in New England, and scaling up to something that's more real, realistic farm size field. And that's what we intend to do uh, between Iowa and Ohio over the next couple of uh, field seasons, we intend to scale up to a more realistic size. If you're interested in getting more information about perimeter trap cropping or even trying it, uh, you can call or email the Iowa State University or, or Ohio State University team members. I also recommend a, um, a set of tips from the New England perimeter trap crop gurus, uh, that's Ruth Hazard and Jude Boucher, they're, these are very practical tips for growers, and they're listed at this URL, uh, which is uh, available online open access. So at that point, we uh, can open it up for questions on perimeter trap cropping or whatever else is on your mind. Okay, I don't see that anybody has entered any questions yet. We can try for a couple minutes. Maybe somebody will ask some. I'll just add some, um, some additional comments that we didn't mention. Um, Muskmelon is a challenge for one reason because it is fairly attractive to cucumber beetles. So there wasn't a lot of information before we started our work as to what maybe muskmelon was going to be too attractive uh, to work as a main crop. But it turned out with that buttercup around it, the muskmelon main crop was still reasonably well protected. We did not see situations in Iowa of high pressure, but um, Celeste mentioned to me that some of the situations in Ohio State uh, were, were higher pressure. So they, there were a number of different situations in terms of beetle pressure that we evaluated. This is all still early work and more to be done to really gain some confidence in uh, the reliability of this method. Okay, we've got a couple of questions in now. Uh, Blaine has asked, would this work in a very small garden? Um, actually, I haven't tried it myself, but oh. I, I think in theory, I have recommended the gardeners try it. What I would suggest is to do something like, uh, it has to be a really small scale, like a pot, it's like say, if you're gonna grow six zucchini plants, then maybe take two potted zucchini plants. Uh, I'm saying potted because you could put them out earlier, even if there's a danger of frost but definitely do the advanced business of, you know, put them out in advance with the idea and be prepared just to either chemically or mechanically kill the beetles that get on them. But in theory, it should work. You're, you just have to be very vigilant to, um, to try and kill the beetles that come into that trap crop. Other questions for Hilly? The next question is from Jeff. Uh, he says, does it have to be a perimeter or would a row work on a small field? Actually, that's a super question and, and something that the New Englanders have started with to some extent. It doesn't have to be a square plot. Ours were 50 feet by 50 feet. But um, the thinking is, uh, at least among the New Englanders, that, that that field shape can be fairly varied. Uh, but um, it's really important to keep those border rows intact the whole season. So if somebody drives a tractor over the border rows or a bunch of them, die from bacterial wilt. That protection is no longer there and the beetles can charge through um, that gap and get into the field and that sometimes happens. So it's fairly important to protect the health and vigor of the border rows. That's something we didn't talk about in the presentation, but that's something that the New Englanders have emphasized to us. Mike Patrick has asked then, um, do the perimeter squashes actually produce a crop? Oh yes. Absolutely. The, the buttercup, um, at least in our farmer's markets, is a fairly marketable crop, uh, far more so than Hubbard squash. Um, Hubbard squash, people look at and unless you back over it with a car, it's really hard to, to, to eat it. Okay, next question. Um, 
Jeff has also asked, um, what other trap crops are high value to the beetles uh, other than Hubbard and Buttercup? Well, I was going to say that within the, if you're familiar with the, you know, the sort of taxonomy of cucurbits, it's anything that's cucurbita maxima. Um, so the Hubbard squash and the buttercup squash are both in that, that maxima species, as well as uh, Turk's turban and that, that uh, what's it called, jumbo pink banana. And the, um, there are a number of, there's some smaller Hubbards, not just the big New England Hubbards, but anything that's cucurbita maxima is generally considered to be the most attractive to beetles. I, I'd recommend against tur Turk's turban uh, mm -hmm. because it is so susceptible and it's, it's so attractive that it gets totally beetle covered and dies in a heartbeat. One of the good things about Hubbard and um, Buttercup is they're fairly robust plants and they don't go down as fast as tur Turk's turban. Okay, well, I think we have no other questions. Um, just if anybody has any comments, go ahead and go for those. I, I would just say that, um, you know, this is really just taking advantage of the beetle's preference for things that are early, robust, and attractive. So personally, as an entomologist trying to get research plots done, I've turned it upside down. I, you know, in a research farm where I see horticulture people doing experiments with all kinds of cucurbits, I try and find out when they're planting and I make sure to get my plantings out two weeks early because I want the beetles. So, you know, this can work at a farmscape level. Basically, you're trying to pull the beetles into areas first. And if you do it in a nice structured thing like Mark was talking about, you can really use it as a control mechanism. But you can also just pay attention to this across your farmscape and uh, deal with where the beetles are showing up first and try and get that first generation and that'll, that'll help as well. We think this might be a fairly potent weapon, the, the perimeter trap cropping, but we're still deciding how to aim it properly. I guess the other thing I would mention, this is Celeste, that as Mark briefly mentioned, you definitely have to pay attention to some other pests. The first year we did it, we just got wiped out by squash vine borer. Um, and it was to the point where we almost had no trap crop by midsummer. So the second year, we really, really were very aggressive about treating squash vine borer and it made a really big difference. So that's, well, I mean, depending on your location, but we tend to have very high pressure from that pest. So it's really something you need to um, stay on top of. It's something that's gotten really bad in Iowa too, uh, uh, increasingly in recent years. <laughs> Other comments? Okay, uh, Robert Beck has asked if there will be a listing of other pests to watch out for with various trap crops, uh, something like a field guide. You just gave us an idea, Robert. Um, it could be that we should just add that. When, when this goes online, when this webinar goes online, we can add a slide uh, about pests to watch for in perimeter trap cropping. I think that should work. Okay, uh, so I don't see any more questions coming in. We've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, I think uh, if it's all right, we'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we'll be sending out other uh, emails in the future for some other webinars that we'll be hosting and have a good night. Any other comments from our presenters or anyone? Thanks, Haley, for being our technical genius. Yeah, thank you, Haley. <laughs> you bet. Good night, everybody.